from the front pages of your newspapers to your television screens, we bring you captivating stories, separating the noise from the facts, giving you relevant and accurate information all the time. This is the headliner, and I am your host, Nabila Jogi. Thank you so much for being part of us today as we delve into a bit of a deeper discussion surrounding the role of the media in, in fostering development in the nation. And to do that and help me unpack this really interesting story, I am joined in studio this today by Fungai Anthony Socks, who is a journalist and working in the field specifically relating to human interest stories. Thank you so much, Anthony, for joining us here on The Headliner. Thank you so much, Nabila, for having me. It's such a pleasure. And, you know, we we love the idea of working with human interest stories. Um, but, you know, we could you give us an insight into something that really attracts you as a human interest journalist? So what, uh, what has attracted me to human interest stories over the years is that um, when, you, when you look at the current uh, makeup of the uh, media space, you find that most of the stories that are coming out, they may, may be actually coming from a different background where maybe they're, they're determined, maybe it's from a Western perspective or at times they're dominated by prominent figures. But what then what then happens is that we are forgetting to share the stories of people who are resilient because Africa, when you look at it uh, on a broader spe uh, uh, spectrum, it has been portrayed to be a continent that's uh, filtered with challenges and wars, but we do have uh, people who are doing amazing work within the communities, our uncelebrated heroes. Absolutely, and that is exactly the core of what we will be unpacking today right here on the headliner, have we failed as Africa and as media to tell our own story? But before we dive into that, obviously it is the headliner. We need to take a look at a few stories that made our headlines this week and we're gonna jump right into the H Metro. Now the headline reads, anxiety grips combi operators. Now public service vehicle operators and motorists have welcomed the new restrictions on combis, reducing route permits from the current 120 kilometer radius to just 60 kilometers and directing that they all be fitted with speed limiting and monitoring devices now in a statement on tuesday the ministry of transport and infrastructural development said they decided to reduce the radius following a comprehensive review of the current radius based restrictions for combis now anthony what do you think about this headline i think it was long overdue to do that <laughs> so we have been having having a lot of carnaging, uh, carnages on the road, yes, uh, the indeed. month of August, and I think it was long overdue. I know that opinion is divided uh, with uh, the uh, bus, with the combi operators, mm -hmm. saying it's the buses that are causing accident, but I think it was long overdue. We need to reduce uh, the road carnage on the road, and I think the ministry should, uh, the Ministry of Transport and Infrastructure Development should also go a step further and actually uh, invoke stiffer penalties even on ordinary motorists, mm -hmm. so that we have um, we, we have responsible drivers on the road. So I wanted to zone in a little bit on the speed limiting um, and monitoring devices. You know, is it are we able to manipulate these devices? Are we able to get around something like this? You know, is this going to actually work? I think it 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 it, it will work, but it it's going to be quite a lot of challenge. Knowing how um, uh, we need to do a lot in terms of our country. Um, in infrastructure, tech, but it's something that's doable. And I know that the Ministry of Transport uh, and Infrastructure Development, they've got the capacity to do that. But a lot of work will need to be put in. And you see, that's the thing, you know, we, uh, we're talking about a lot of work. We've had so much that that specific ministry has been doing. Um, and this is adding on to the extra admin that comes with that and the monitoring of it and making sure that these, these devices are actually in place, being utilized and not being sort of abused in any way, you know, and that's, that's the interesting part of it. Yeah, so I, I think the VIQ uh, inspection, VID mm. department, I think they need to be, be back on the road, actually, because we've been talking about, um, you know, our roads not being worthy of our cars. Mm -hmm. But now, recently... Our, our uh, cars we, worthy of our roads. Yeah, now the <laughs> question is that. our cars with, with, with our roads. So I think we also need to be, uh, to be, to be looking at that. And I, 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 I recently was in SA just uh, attending, of course, the Yali Regional Leadership Conference. Uh, the state of the road, even the state of the cars, uh, the the cars that they have, and most of our cars that are on the road. Partly, uh, we need to have a look at that. So I think we also now need to have an assignment 
to see if our cars are roadworthy as yeah, well. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough <laughs> one because you know your car, you know, it, it can be your biggest asset at some point in yeah, your I life. Know. So that's an interesting yeah. one. But uh, just before we jump onto the next headli- headline, I just want to chat a bit about the radius reduction from 120 kilometer radius to 60 kilometer radius because you specifically mentioned Anthony that you know before it was the at, and you, uh, you spoke about the two split divide in opinion um, that you know the combi drivers are saying the road carnage is caused by the buses who are actually on that long distance journey mm-hmm. what do you think the impact of this radius reduction will be i think i think because the main cause of accidents overall in zimbabwe has been uh speeding so i think limiting that when you have uh, buses uh, moving on the on the highways i think we are going to see a massive improvement then when it comes to the radius i think it's going to be quite a challenge in terms of uh, implementing that to say 60 kilometers because i i i, I noticed i i as i was checking the the states mm. within the the routes i uh, would find that some distances are 70 kilometers and some um maybe 65 or 62 so i foresee that in terms of inf- enforcing all those regulations we might be having combi is actually moving uh, 60 kilometers, then figuring out ways in which uh, they can then manipulate the other two kilometers to transport. It's, it's going to be quite a lot of headache in implementing that. Well, I think implementation all around is going to be interesting. We've spoken about mm. the implementation of the speed limiting devices and monitoring mm. devices on there. Also, just monitoring how that radius reduction is going to be adhered to is going to be very interesting. But, you know, I love the initiative and I love the fact that we are taking steps towards something that is so critical and is so very important. But now we're going to jump onto the chronic and this headline reads Zim China seal 17 major deals. Now Zimbabwe and China have reaffirmed their comprehensive strategic partnership of cooperation by signing 17 agreements and memorandums of understanding across various sectors that include agriculture, infrastructure development as well as mining. Last but not least, um, I just want to quickly jump in here and have a very quick conversation around this specific headline with you, Anthony. You know, what do you think about these MOUs? Do you think that they are documents that have been signed between two nations and the implementation? Once again, we come back to implementation. Or do you think that we are actually going to live and abide by these? Um, I think we have, we have seen some uh, good uh, bilateral agreements uh, mm-hmm. actually coming in and some, some projects actually being implemented. But the truth of the matter is that we have had uh, a lot of uh, pending projects that are yet to be implemented. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing that we are having um, China as an alternative uh, partner. Uh, I, I know that our, our, our country, we still have a bit of restrictions from the West. So I think for now, uh, we need to be looking at that at how best possibly within the next three years so we can see these projects being delivered on the ground. Do you think that there's a specific sector that really requires attention in terms of these? And I know we, we and I absolutely agree with this, we consistently call China our all-weather friend. And I believe in that. I mean, no other country is stepping up and signing 17 agreements with us. But do you think that there's a specific sector that we need to make sure that we are highlighting with regards to these partnerships? Yeah, in terms of these partnerships, I think um, mining, when it comes to the mining sector, I just I just feel that we need also to be a bit um, strict in terms of the value addition part where our minerals are benefiting our country that for now is my greatest concern to make sure that uh, when when we are having all those partnerships and agreements what is Zimbabwe is Zimbabwe getting its fair share of peace and that is not uh, short changed it gets what it deserves so I think uh, otherwise for now I think this is the way to go Mm, I like that. I like that. Now we've got one last headline and that is the headline that we are going to be, you know, really surrounding ourselves upon today. And that headline is from the Herald. Now the the headline states, President throws immediate challenge. President Mnangagwa has underscored the critical role that the, that the media can play in promoting national interests and achieving a shared vision, stressing that it should inspire nations to work towards their goals. Now this is what we are going to be jumping into in the second segment of the headliner really going into it and tearing it apart and going into as much detail as possible my name is Nabila Joki this is the headliner make sure you're staying with us
Welcome back to the headliner, the place that you get to delve into the headlines, the place that you get your information onto your screen straight out of your newspapers. But it's not done by us alone here. We always have somebody very interesting in studio to help us unpack the stories that we look at in detail. Specifically today, we are looking at a headline that made the Herald that states the president throws a media challenge. And the president has underscored the critical role that the media can play in promoting a national interests and achieving a shared vision, stressing that it should inspire nations to work towards their goals. Now, to help me unpack this issue and more, I am joined in studio today by Anthony Socks, who is a fellow journalist and who has been from the first segment of the headliner, assisting me in unpacking quite a few issues. Thank you so much for joining us, Anthony. Thank you so much, Navila. Right, Anthony, let's jump straight in. You know, you and I are both in this, in this role and, you know, in the media and we're in front of the nation and in fact beyond the nation we're in front of the world now what do you think the role of us as the media is generally okay the role of the media of course is granted under section 61 of our constitution freedom of expression freedom freedom of media as well as reporting accurately on national issues but as we do this this should in turn foster nation building uh, which is what the, uh, the president is talking about uh, in terms of shaping our own narratives, taking charge of our own stories. The perception that is out there, if you remember when uh, Tiffany had the American mm -hmm. interest came, that uh, video that went viral uh, when she acted, whether she was acting or actually surprised that we were at a supermarket. She said in her defense that um, what had driven her to make that was to demystify the perception that there's war in Africa, there's poverty in Africa. And that tells you a story that mm -hmm. we've got a lot of work to do to show people that we are doing great and amazing things in Africa. And that is the role of the media is to bring these stories to light. Uh, stories of development, where roads are being built, where communities are um, you know, moving uh, to, to a better place from where they were, where there's development within the community. And the role of the media is to bring these issues to attention. No, I absolutely think that's uh, that's so very, very true. Um, do you think that we have been playing our role as the media? To 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 some extent, um, I would I would probably say taking going back to the twenty twenty three elections, we had the. Uh, Zimbabwe Television Network uh, and other media channels, they covered election exceptionally well. Um, you, we had also a site that's known as Site, uh, which is based in Blawayo, they, they did well. And we have a lot of uh, players that have been coming on board and that are doing well. And we have also seen uh, the opening up of, you know, uh, space. So I believe in that context that we've been doing well, but we have still have a challenge uh, in terms of issues that we are covering. Most of the news, uh, I, had, I have a friend who always said when I open the newspaper, I move to the sports section because the front section at times is just full of negative stories. So mm. I think I feel we need to be having, you know, more positive stories that inspire the community, uh, that inspire and build our communities and eventually build our nation. Well, absolutely, you know, and the reality and the, I think the difficulty, the hardship of playing mm. this role that we do play in media is while we can look for the inspirational stuff, part of our job is to give the reality that's on the ground. You know, we, mm. see, we see headlines that relate to crime, uh, murder. Thank, thank goodness that our country is so blessed in that we don't see this uh, on an everyday basis, but it is there. So how do we navigate between that inspirational reporting and realistic on the ground, true natural reporting? Okay, so I think, of course, we do need to strike a balance uh, where bad things or where the negative things um, possibly happening lately here in Zim. We have had, um, we have had quite a lot of you know, corruption being uh, brought to the forefront by the media, and it is also the role of the media to actually bring these issues to spotlight so that uh, you know, people, uh, those who are found on the wrong side of the law, are prosecuted, and the media is an essential key player as the fourth state in ensuring that, uh, in promoting good governance, of course, as well as, as, well as democracy. So it's it always important to highlight the negative issues issues as well uh, so that they are corrected. Absolutely. Now, you have spoken about the changes that have happened in the type of uh, things that we are reporting, the media that is coming to the fore. Do you think that, or how do you think uh, the media and the work of the media, the role of the media has metamorphosized and changed under the Second Republic? 
Under the Second Republic, we have seen uh, tolerance in terms of uh, freedom of speech, and that's one big milestone uh, accomplishment. We have seen the opening of airwaves. We have seen the coming in of new players, the Zimbabwe Television Network, Rusunungoko, 3K TV. We now have previously, we only had one radio, one, one, one television station, but we've, we've been seeing the coming up of uh, new players within the media space. The same um, with, uh, in, with even community radio stations. We've been having community radio stations uh, being uh, registered. And we have also had the Minister of Information uh, and Publicity touring various media houses, uh, uh, both print and broadcast, so that you know we have a good relationship between the state as well as the fourth estate. Right, so I have an, uh, a small thing that I wanted to discuss with you regarding that. Mm -hmm. You know, we do need to realize and recognize that you are talking about mainstream media, but we also we also have the popping up of bloggers and vloggers and social media, you know, and that, that can, it's really got a massive impact. It didn't maybe a decade ago, but today people look to social media for their news before they will turn into a newspaper. You know, those people have a responsibility as much as we do, if not more. What are mm. your thoughts to go? Uh, regarding that yeah so thank you so much for bringing uh, that to light we have now we have even years at bc streaming online we have mm -hmm. uh, various channels streaming online we have got the coming up of um you know bloggers as you say uh, uh streaming online and all sorts of uh, news channel what probably we need to be to maybe possibly the role that we need to be playing uh, both uh, professional journalists as well as citizen journalists, those who are taking up the space because of the evolution of digital channels, is to make sure that in reporting and covering issues, they are doing that uh, so responsibly because the risk with social media uh, as well as other, you know, so many people coming into the space because it's, it's really available is that of fake news, uh, is that of uh, misinformation. So as long as we do that, uh, reporting things ac uh, ac uh, accurately as well as building uh, communities, I think we will be on the right track. So, yeah, you know, I do agree that we would be on the right track. And, you know, so I, I was actually in a situation just uh, about two weeks ago, where mm -hmm. as I was walking out after one of my bulletins that there was a group of school children just outside the building. Um, and they knew my name, they knew what bulletin I work on, and they were so happy to see me. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a realization moment, moment, almost like an existential crisis of who I am and what my role actually means to society and how, how much of an obligation I have in my mannerisms, my characteristics, the way I speak, the information that I provide, not on air, but everywhere else right mm -hmm. um what do you think the potential consequences of us as the as the media failing to carry out our obligation major consequences major major consequences of course number one we i, I spoke about uh, misinformation then number two we you will have because you see the challenge with the media space is that you find that we control in terms of perceptions, narratives, how the society thinks or the upbringing of the society from a child. Uh, as, as far as they are young, if they are told certain things that are not possibly pro-national development, they may actually grow up hating their government. But if they are told or taught in a way that allows them to be constructive and to think in a way that foster and promote national building, you'll find them actually navigating towards that direction. So I, I believe that you and me, Nabila, I think we need to, to take our role, to assume our role in building uh, this community through being a responsible uh, journalist, through inspiring the, the younger generation as well in terms of how we carry ourselves, not just publicly, but privately as well. I don't know if I've done justice to your question. Absolutely, you have. And with that justice, the headliner takes a short break. Be with us to continue this very interesting discussion. This is the headliner.
welcome to the third segment of the Headliner, where today we have been unpacking everything related to the challenge that has been posed to the media by our president. And that was in the that was the headline of the Herald this week. I am joined in studio today by Anthony Jocks to help me unpack this. He is a journalist as well, and he's had some wonderful insight. Thank you so much for being part of the show today. Thank you so much, Vila. You're very welcome. So I wanted to just dive into the actual story itself and just, uh, you know, just deconstruct some of what the challenge actually is that the president has given us. And the court says, it is my view, perhaps it is a biased view. If you listen to the Chinese media, yes, you are the people. You have always promoted your country, the vision of your country. But in African countries, you'll find our media, if you're not careful, influenced by external factors where they compare their own situation with foreign positions and as the media begins to criticize itself that it, that it is inferior it is because they are comparing themselves with a foreign nation now you know basically what we're saying here is that us as the African media we fail to tell our story because we are in comparative mode what do you think of that so there's a lot of uh, thank you so much for bringing uh, that up there's a lot of diversity that comes with us being African we are different from how from the from the European uh, society, and I think that comparative factor comes in when we fail to recognize such uh, diversity that is within us, and such is such richness that is within our culture. So I, I and I and I and and like as I told you, I was attending a fellowship recently. Mm. So in that fellowship, I think I interacted from a, a, a good friend who's in. Um, was in Zambia, was based in Zambia, was running a good business in Zambia, and I was trying to actually tell him and convince him that there's space and opportunity uh, for what he wants to do here in Zimbabwe, and he was quite hesitant. Then someone had to tell him, someone who had visited Zimbabwe, who's not Zimbabwean, mm -hmm. that I know we have been to Zimbabwe, ABC is happening in this space, and he's like, oh, then he started considering actually coming to Zimbabwe. So where, that, where does that boil, boil down to? It boils down to the narrative that's being uh, shaped or that's being uh, sort of shared outside. So I think as Africans, it's important to say, despite the challenges that we face, we need to be celebrating the good things that are happening. We need to be celebrating uh, the stories of, you know, uh, community uh, builders, people and businesses who are doing well. Uh, we have lately here in Zimbabwe, uh, we have SMEs contributing to eight billion uh, in terms of the country's gross domestic product. That's a beautiful story. Mm, we have got a building boom. Uh, people are building houses, but from the other side, you you hear that you know there are challenges A, B, C, D. Um, uh, bit governance, uh, but you don't really get to hear of the good uh, projects or initiatives that are happening. And it's like that uh, in almost each and every, every African countries. And I feel we should take charge of our narratives. Absolutely. And do you think that the fact that we haven't taken charge of our own narratives, not being a, being able to um, tell our own story because of ourselves, not because of anything else, because we look to, to Western examples, do you think that has perpetuated an inferiority complex within Africans, especially with regards to our younger generation? It has, because the, the, the information that they're consuming who we'll, we'll tell them that they are inferior? And and I've always been on record to say, if you if you had, if you were told uh, that possibly uh, what 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 you are the possibly maybe what I'm wearing, if they say it is not blue but it's dark blue or it's black, they would believe that. So I feel that it's it comes back to actually feeding them with the right information when they are young. Which, is, which means, as the media space, we need to be producing and sharing content that actually enables them to know that they're in charge of their destiny, they're in charge of their future, that we have great Africans who are doing well. We have uh, upcoming African businesses that are doing very well here. Uh, we, we have a, a couple uh, here. So I think it's, it's, it's our role to, discon to deconstruct uh, the bad uh, perceptions that have been uh, painted by the Western media. 
So now there's actually, there is something that we need to zone in on. There is a difference between exposing our young people to worldly stuff, to stuff beyond Africa, beyond mm. the borders of Africa as a mm. continent, um, because that also hampers who we are as a person, um, as a nation, and, you know, as a continent. But I think that we also have the opportunity to learn from the, the, the bad things that have happened in the West and not bring them into our country and learn from them as a positive. For example, we have a war against drugs. You know, that's mm. almost the gangster lifestyle is almost mm. it's made to be a cool thing it's made to, it's positivized mm. in the west and that has been translated into our country and that's why you know we have a war against drugs so how do we balance the two without completely shutting out the other world yeah so so i so thank you for for bringing that up i had not actually said we should shut up the other world but i mm. but then i think my emphasis was on information so that we strike a balance so that we fit them um the good thing when it comes to the media, I think these days parents they do have they do have control. They do have ways in which they can co control the information, mm. which are the the, the children, uh, the, the the kids or the youngsters, the upcoming youngsters are consuming. So I think it's now a matter of the role of uh, parents as well as the role of uh, guardians to actually play a role in ensuring that uh, young young people, those who are upcoming that they consume uh, information that doesn't destroy them, but mm -hmm. information that takes them forward. Absolutely. You know, and I'm going to just quickly come back to the quote from the president. And it says, the media must anchor itself on the basis of what is available. The concrete issues of each respective country promote their own country. Make sure you, the media, give confidence to every child, every citizen that a country is built by its own. And this was said by our president, President Emerson Mnangagwa, uh, whilst attending the forum on China-Africa cooperation. And I think that this is such a valid, valid point. What are your thoughts here? Very valid point. I used to have an, a, a, a perception that, you know, for a country uh, to be built, it, it maybe took, maybe it was the, just the role of the government. But now I think, as, as I had been speaking, especially what changed all that thinking was the fellowship that I attended, where we, where it is possible that, you know, you, you find out that great countries, uh, they've been built by their own citizens in terms of they've played their, their role in, you know, building their nations. But that doesn't start just at the national level. It starts within the community level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the president is saying to say, Everything, everything, all the good initiatives, projects uh, that are happening within communities, within Zimbabwe, within Africa, they need to be told. These stories, they need to be shared so that they inspire our generation. And he's also saying, I think that we should focus more on issues that foster national development than ones that destroy. Because, Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, that just comes, it always comes back to Nika, you know, like that is where it comes back to. That's the crux of it, right? Exactly. But just in closing, um, uh, you know, what do you think some of the obstacles are that are hindering our, as the media's ability to effectively contribute to national development? I think I think one immediate uh, that I've noted is possibly maybe when it comes to the community uh, radio stations. I uh, figured out that the last time that I checked, the licensing fee was very high. I think it was nearing a total of almost one thousand uh, a year as of twenty twenty two. I'm not really sure if this had have been updated. Uh, in Kenya, on the contrary you find that it's around three, four hundred dollars uh, a year. So I think these are just community radio stations. We haven't spoken about um, the, 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 the TV licenses, the radio licenses. So I think the licensing regime, I think it, that it needs to be re-looked at. Uh, that's number one. So that we have more players coming in. And with more players coming in, it means we are family very much in charge of our narratives. I think that's number one. Then number two, the challenges may be at times their polar polarization uh, as well as issues to do with uh, misinformation, whether sponsored or not. And I think we need to promote um, responsible and accurate reporting uh, in, in national issues. So I think these are the challenges that, that we face. But I think to answer the last part, you how to solve that you, you spoke about the the, the social media mm -hmm. these days we've got social media where we where you have uh, a lot of people playing around social media so how we use it it should also act as a key player in terms of how we disseminate uh, information i absolutely agree with that and i think those are three 
excellent um, uh, hindrances or obstacles that we may have. And I love the way you didn't look at it so insularly. You, lo you took it outside and you gave us a comparison with the licensing fees that we see being charged in Zimbabwe versus the ones in Kenya. And you actually came with that information. And that ex is exactly what you were talking about to your second point, which was the polarization and you know our the misinformation stage. And that, that needs to be rectified. And then lastly, promotion of responsible and accurate reporting. I think those three encapsulate everything that you've said and it has been such an absolute ultimate pleasure having you on the headliner today um you know any last any last thoughts to go out to our media fraternity to our youth that are thinking about joining our fraternity think about studying media any last thoughts to those i think uh you know the media space is quite a very very interesting space that enables i i i, I transitioned from uh, being someone who was uh, who, who started business made a career u10 over the years have been reporting on human interest stories so i think it's, it's been fun because the dealing with actually people uh, people and stories of resilience and difficulties and people overcoming them I feel I think I've been playing my role in nation building and in actually telling all the stories that uh, that are untold. So I think with that, I feel this is a great space where each and every one of us, even at a citizen level, in whatever it is that we are doing, we are the amb ambassadors of our own uh, country uh, as well as Africa at large. Oh, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Socks, for being on the headliner. The headliner opens up the pages of your newspaper, delves into the words, and we close those papers with the analysis that we've unpacked for you today. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure that you are catching us uh, up with us across our social media. We've loved having you. Thank you so much. My name is Nabila Jogi. I was your host of today's The Headliner.